All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, a couple of announcements to uh, cover uh, real quick. Uh, Jim and Phyllis Minor, uh, Myers Ministry, um, we're sending over uh, items to help them out. And uh, I guess there's a collection of boxes somewhere in the back. Uh, if you want to donate items, uh, Tom and Ann, right, we'll get them boxed up. We'll get them shipped over. And then if you want to uh, contribute to uh, defray the cost of shipping, uh, see Tom and Ann Wright. And then uh, this this Saturday, August 8th, uh, from 4.30 to 7.30, is going to be game night uh, for kids and adults. There will be pizza and treats here. So if you have any uh, special uh, pizza or dietary requests uh, for that evening, you can email Mark Friedrich, Friedrich at uh, friedrich.m at sbcglobal.net friedrich.m at sbcglobal.net dietary request send them um, and then uh, just a quick update uh, Doug and I have been working with uh, uh, Natal the city of Natal trying to get back over there and we got word the other day that we've got uh, last year we had one church when we went over it was uh, we met it was a small church that met in a home but they had made the garage into uh, into a, a, a fellowship hall and I think we had probably 30 or 40 people there for the Romans 1 through 8 series and this year we've got uh, uh, a larger venue we've been given a larger venue we just found this out so we're really excited about it we've been given a larger venue uh, it's gonna go probably be able to seat about 200 people it looks like there's about three or four churches that are interested this time so uh, if you guys could be in prayer for that uh, we need your prayers and your support we, we are taking dm2 material romans 1 through 8 and that's what we're going over to teach but we're, we're really going over to represent uh, west houston bible church um, and so we're we're excited about the opportunities there um, and that's going to be uh, the week of October 4th through 11th. We're actually going to be teaching the 7th through the 11th. Uh, I'm going to get there a few days early. I'm not sure if Doug is going to make it early or not, but we start there uh, teaching Wednesday, October 7th, and we'll teach Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And then last year we were given uh, Sunday, uh, so maybe we'll, we'll get Sunday as well. So exciting things. Just keep us in your prayers. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, doing that. The uh, so Galatians five verses uh, sixteen through twenty three uh, teaches us that at any moment we're either walking by the Spirit or according to the sin nature. When we walk by the Spirit, we enjoy fellowship with God. Uh, we enjoy, uh, enjoy fellowship with the Son uh, Jesus Christ. And during these times, the Holy Spirit's uh, work, uh, His work in us, is to illuminate our minds to the truth of Scripture and to challenge us to apply scripture. But when we sin, we grieve and quench his uh, ministry and, and uh, our, our thinking, our lives, our works, uh, everything's grounded in the sin nature. It has no eternal value. And the only way to uh, recover that fellowship is to confess our sins. Uh, when we name our sins, the uh, enabling ministry of the Holy Spirit is restored uh, to our lives. And... Uh, we're able to function in a way that glorifies God. So let's take a moment, uh, exercise uh, 1 John 1 9, and I'll open us up in prayer. Father, uh, thank you uh, again for the opportunity to. Uh, to share your word. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, for Doug and I both to uh, to grow. Have uh, practice our teaching um, and we plan to take this over to Natal. We're thankful for uh, faithful men and women that come here uh, to hear us. Um, we pray that you'll bless tonight's uh, teaching. Uh, give me, uh, give my tongue the, the right words to say. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So I thought we'd take a moment and kind of uh, back up and talk just a little bit about parables since the last couple of Bible classes or last uh, few uh, studies that we've done here in the life of Christ have been centered around parables. I don't know about you, but I have a tendency to read parables in the Bible kind of from a third person perspective, you know, as if I'm uh, maybe in the audience watching a play unfold before me. And, um, you know, a lot of times I end up missing the point of the parable, at least for me, uh, you know, the point that, uh, 
that that our Lord's trying to make. Because it's very easy to kind of take that third person perspective. You know, this was back when Jesus was dealing with the those nasty Pharisees and those dumb Jews that uh, rejected him. Um, and um, but really, uh, I think that. Uh, the parables, particularly at this point in, in Jesus' ministry, we see that that our Lord's offer of the kingdom has been rejected by uh, by the leadership of Israel. It's been rejected uh, collectively by uh, the Jewish people, and not to a person. Uh, there certainly were uh, people that were becoming disciples of our Lord, um, but but uh, we see that there's been this shift in our Lord's ministry, and he he's kind of changed from. Uh, the door, the door for the offer to the kingdom to Israel is starting to close, and the door for the mystery of the church, the mystery at the time of the church, is starting to open. And so Jesus has shifted his parables, and what you see in Scripture is that, that uh, the Pharisees uh, and, and the Jewish people and even his disciples are, are confused by what he's saying and teaching. But he always takes the time to, to pull his uh, disciples aside and explain the meaning of the parable. And so the, I see this thread of truth, right, from in, in the parable, uh, in, in the explanation that our Lord's given uh, that runs to us in the church age. Now, these parables had to do with the kingdom, and we know that the kingdom was postponed um, when, when Israel rejected it, and, and it, it's been postponed till the second advent of Christ. And so there's the teachings of these parables uh, are about the kingdom, but th there's application for us. You know, there, there's the principles of the kingdom are very similar to the principles of the church age. You know, uh, the kingdom is about uh, the principle of the kingdom is is uh, righteousness. The um, the purpose of the kingdom is peace, and uh, the object of the kingdom is the glory of God. And and through God glorifying God, it will be our joy. And so even though these parables are teaching about the kingdom, uh, they have, I think there's a thread of application here for us. Um, the, uh, if you look at Matthew 10, or Matthew 13, verses 10 through 14, I'll just read through it quickly. Um, Jesus kind of touches on this, because he, he gets asked, you know, hey, what's going on, Lord? Um, you're saying all these things, and all these people are, are confused. And so Jesus gives them an answer. He says, and, and the disciples came to him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. And here we see that kind of that transition, right? The doors for the mystery of the kingdom of heaven. And, and we know that the church age came in in between there. It's that inter, uh, interdispensational, the church age is inserted in there. But the door for the the kingdom for Israel, that offer, that kingdom door is closing, and the future kingdom door is opening. And so Jesus is explaining that. And for whoever has to him, for whoever has to him, more will be given, and and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has, what, even what he's been given, will be taken from him. In verse 13, therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear nor do they understand. So, um, you know, we touched on this a little bit, but, you know, what we see here is, is Jesus is purposely uh, structuring his parables in a way where, you know, he shifted his ministry. He's come to a point where uh, his ministry is no longer directed at, at Israel, but it's beginning to shift to, to the Gentiles. The Great Commission is coming up shortly. Um, and, and he's starting to, uh, the, the founders of our, the church, our church, the body of Christ, the, the Lord's church, um, the founders, he's starting to train them. And so in this training of them, I think we can see uh, connections that draw us into scripture, into these parables that directly relate to our lives here in, uh, here in the church age. So I think we left off uh, Tuesday with, uh, Doug was explaining uh, teaching or talking about the uh, the antagonistic uh, Pharisees, and they went after Jesus um, uh, after one of the divine institutions, which is marriage. And um, we see that the Pharisees uh, in this in this confrontation very antagonistic towards Jesus, uh, clearly trying to trap him, uh, create a uh, get him to stumble to say something that they could. Uh, bring before Israel and, and disprove and discredit him. 
And, and we see uh, Jesus responds to their you know, very low view of marriage uh, with a very high view of marriage using the illustration of one, fle- uh, of one flesh. And uh, the one flesh that, ba- that bound Adam and Eve. And Jesus tells us, uh, the Pharisees, that what God, has, uh, what God has bound together, let no man separate. And so we see this stark contrast here between the, the Pharisees attacking uh, Jesus uh, on this divine institution and, and, and Jesus responding with, with the truth of the word um, and, it, and, and his very high view of marriage. Now, Jesus goes on later to expand uh, on the concept of marriage, um, and he sets a, a very high bar. It's a very limited circumstance. Moses did grant certificates of divorce, which is what the Pharisees brought up. But uh, Jesus points out that he did that because of their hardness of heart. Um, and uh, we see later that Jesus uh, put some very limited uh very limited circumstances um, on on divorce, and so we know our Lord has a very high, very high view of marriage. I think it's worth noting that this whole confrontation um, about marriage occurred in uh, Perea, and Perea is a uh, it's a province on, it's located on the northeastern side of the Jordan River, and it's where uh, Herod Antipas or Herod the Great, uh, it's one of his provinces. And uh, if, we, uh, if we look in Scripture, we remember what happened to uh, the last guy that had an argument about divorce with Jesus, right? Or with, uh, with Herod. And that was John. He lost his head over it. So, you know, nothing in Scripture here to, that, uh, that says that this is what the Pharisees had in mind. But it certainly seems like uh, something that they would uh, cook up. I thought that was an interesting uh, choice of location. So let's, uh, let's turn over to Mark 10. Um, and um, we're going to start here in uh, verses 13 through 16. Mark 10, verses 13 through 16. We're going to take this, uh, there's going to be a transition, and this is the way Jesus, uh, uh, when you look through the thread of the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and you know, the Synoptic Gospels, you always see this kind of, there's a confrontation, and there's some kind of rejection, and then, and then there's another confrontation, and, and Jesus demonstrates grace, and then there's a teaching moment. And it's, it's very similar here. Um, so we, we, have, you know, we have to keep in mind that the context, what the, what the disciples were seeing. You know, they just saw this really nasty confrontation with the Pharisees over marriage. And now all of a sudden, um, some children walk up. And so let's, let's read through verses uh, 13 through 16 and see what, uh, see what opens up here. And then they brought the little children to him that he, that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased, and he said to them, Let the little, little children come to me, and do not, be, do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took, up, he took them up in his arms, and he laid his hands on them, and he blessed them. Um, so we see this account um, in uh, Matthew 19, uh, verses 13 and 15, and Luke 18, verses 15 through 17. But uh, tonight we're going to talk about Mark's account. And, and Mark uh, uh, does an interesting thing here. He, he, he really focuses in something that, that Matthew and Luke don't do. Um, he focuses in on uh, our Lord's emotional reaction. When you read this account in, in Matthew and Luke, you don't hear anything about it. But here Mark takes a whole verse to talk about, you know, Jesus got upset. And so I, I always find this uh, very encouraging, very refreshing when, when uh, an author of Scripture brings out the humanity of Christ, right? And so here we have uh, Christ uh, reacting. I, the Greek word here is agoniteo, agoniteo. And, and what it means is to be very displeased, indignant, uh, to, feel, uh, to feel a violent irritation and even a physical recognizable irritation. And so we know our Lord was perfect, right? And here we see him expressing these very strong emotions, emotions that I know when, when, if I were to express them that they, I would probably not be sanctified. Right. Um, look, so uh, the lesson that to take away from this, though, is that in our Lord's perfect humanity, he had emotions. We have emotions. Our emotions have been um, tainted. All of our lives have been tainted by sin. But emotions in themselves aren't inherently wrong. It's, it's what you do with them. And, and it, it also, too, I think 
when you when you read these stories about Jesus, it really makes things very personal, right? Because you, you can imagine yourself in this in this same situation where um, some kids are coming up to be with you, and, and there's a group of men, you know, that have kept them from coming to see you, and you know, it's a very kind of uh, in my mind, you know, this is the disciples going into snob mode. Like, hey, you're not worthy. You know, don't bother Jesus with your little children. And, and Jesus makes it clear, hey, no, I, I want to come see him. He even closes out with, um, he gives them a, uh, a blessing. And so I, I wanted to develop that a little bit. Um, you know, so in, in the Jewish custom, it was the fathers and the rabbis that, that blessed children. And so Jesus would have been, in this last verse where he gives the children a blessing, right, this would have sent a very powerful message uh, to his audience, to his Jewish audience. In the, in the Jewish world, the father passed the blessing down to his oldest son. Uh, rabbis blessed. But, you know, men on the street didn't bless. And, and so a very interesting, uh, in my mind, a, a message. It doesn't get developed in Scripture, but contextually, you know, we know that... Uh, this would have caused some questions. People would have been asking questions about this. And, and it certainly sets our Lord apart um, from everyone else uh, that's there. The other thing that's interesting here is that in Jewish custom, the blessing was passed down to uh, boys. You know, when they go, when they become of age at their bar mitzvah, this was a, this was a celebration for boys. When, when the father passed on his blessing to his eldest son as, as he was passing away, that was a tradition uh, for, uh, for men. But here we see children. The, the word is children, right? And so when I think of children, I think of boys and girls. And so again, in con for us, it's not a big deal. Boys and girls in our society, we treat them as equals. In Jewish society, there were some distinctions there. And so here's Jesus' blessing you know, both the boys and the girls. Uh, and, and again, in start, you know, rabbis didn't go around blessing girls. Rabbis didn't, uh, uh, fathers didn't go around passing on their inheritance to girls. And, but here we see Jesus uh, blessing uh, both boys and girls, at least by inference uh, with this word children. And so I thought that uh, that was uh, very interesting. Uh, and, and then I think the other thing that, that I kind of pulled out of this as I was studying this, as I was reading through this, is you have you have the Pharisees here we have the Pharisees um, and and they represent Israel corporate Israel the adults and and kind of that generation that generation that rejected Jesus and Jesus has already told us in, in Matthew 13 that he's shifting his ministry now you know he's his offer of the kingdom at least to that generation right they're the ones that that have rejected him um, and and so here we have another generation, though, the children, right? And I thought it was very interesting. I don't know if, uh, you know, if that, that's what Jesus had intended, but certainly there's a distinction here, right? Here's this new generation, and Jesus is blessing them, right? He's not blessing the Pharisees. He's not blessing the adults. He's not blessing the, uh, but yet he takes these young children in. Uh, but, he, but he also uses it as a teaching moment, right? And, and, and the whole point um, that, that we can pull out of this is this childlike humility and that really stands in contrast to the arrogance kind of the rejection um, the uh, you know the antagonism uh, of the Pharisees and of that generation and, and here we have these young children coming to him to uh, to learn from him and to be blessed by him um, so let's uh, let's grab a couple of notes you, everybody get their handouts yes no maybe they're up here. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's, whoops, see, one, two. All right, Matthew, uh, in Mark 10, 13, um, having heard just, uh, having heard, having just heard Jesus teaching on the sanctity of marriage, many brought their children to him so he could pray for them. Many brought his children to him so he could pray for them. In uh, Mark, uh, verse 13, B and 14A, uh, the disciples tried to keep the children from coming to Jesus who used two, and he, who used two commands, permit and do not hinder. 
He did this to show his disciples uh, his displeasure, and then he used it as a teaching moment. He used this uh, moment when he rebuked them as a teaching moment. Uh, and, and that's where he kind of pulls us into this childlike faith. Um, and we'll develop that a little bit here in, uh, in a minute, this childlike faith and, and what, uh, what that means. Verse 14, um, a child's simple faith and dependent character are the qualities that gain entrance into the kingdom. A child's simple faith and dependent character are the qualities that gain entrance into the kingdom. And I think the, the point that, that Jesus is making here is, I, I think it, there's a helplessness that comes with, with being a child. And, you know, I apologize to the parents out here, but there's kind of an innocence too, be, in, at least an innocence of conscience. You know, the children have their old sin natures and they're trying to find their way and, and rule, but, but their conscience isn't the same as that of an adult. And if you give a child a gift, um, they, they react in a, in a very different way than if you give an adult a gift. And there's, there's a childlike humility here that I think our Lord is pointing to. And again, the lesson for us is that, uh, you know, faith alone in Christ alone. I think that's really uh, the message that our Lord's trying to drive home here is that it's, it's faith. It's faith that saves you. Verse 15, Jesus taught that a child's willingness to depend on someone else for its needs shows the humility to gain salvation. I don't like that word gain. It bothers me. But acquire maybe. Uh, I, uh, I didn't put this word in here, but it, it just it rubbed me the wrong way when I read it. Um, I don't think we gain our salvation. Um, I think we're given our salvation. The point here, the point that's being made is that... Um, there's a willingness, and it, and it needs to be in us too, right? There's a willingness to, uh, to depend on Christ, right? Christ's completed work on the cross. Uh, and that's our only way for salvation. If we depend on ourselves in any way, um, then, then we've nullified that salvation gift. And then in verse 16, um, we see, as we concluded, that uh, Jesus compassionately bestowed a blessing on the children the same way the rab uh, that a rabbi would. And, you know, and, we, and we developed this a little bit, but just to kind of go over that, it, the, the distinction between uh, he, wasn't he wasn't blessing the adults that were with him. He wasn't blessing the Pharisees. He wasn't blessing the Sadducees. He was blessing these little children, which in my mind is, is a whole new generation that had not rejected our Lord that had not rejected our Lord. In fact, perhaps he was blessing uh, some of the diaspora that uh, uh, was, was, was getting ready to come. All right, so let's, uh, let's jump over to Matthew, and uh, we're going to see a contrast uh, to this uh, childlike faith. And you know, a quick, a quick uh, rabbit trail here on the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, the, the way this has been put together uh, is based off of a synoptic gospel approach, and so we will jump from Mark to Matthew to Luke. And, and I think for me that, that was very, really helpful to kind of look at it like a symphony, right? And, and, a, and a symphony, if you, if you think of the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as, as, as a, a symphony that, you know, a, it has a musical composition and, and a have has several movements related to a subject, but, but it varies in form and execution. And it usually begins with a very dominant theme into which variations are introduced as intervals, and I'm reading this definition, and, and the variation seems to be developed independently. But, but as the music is played, as, as the gospels unfold, right, the module to, to each other, they, they modulate into each other, they combine together, um, and, and they're brought to a finale. And, and I, when we look at the synoptic gospels, that, that definition really helped me piece together. A lot of times, you know, we, we see these stories, um, and, and, and uh, it, Mark will tell a story from a certain perspective, and then we'll go read the same story in Matthew, and he's telling it from a different perspective, and it raises questions. Well, Mark said this, and Matthew said that. But what we find, um, what we find is that, that it all meshes together into, into a final uh, composition, a, a finality. Um, so just a, a quick rabbit trail on that as we kind of jump around here between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. But So back to uh, 
the uh, back to this contrast of the, of the childlike faith, and and we're going to talk a little bit uh, about the the rich young ruler, and uh, so. One of the things we need to note is we've transitioned. We kind of follow this transition, and and again in in the symphony concept here, right? So we've gone from the Pharisees that that are rejecting Christ to the children that are accepting Christ, and now we have this new guy that shows up on the scene, right? He's, and uh, this you know his social standing was far from that of a child, and and he provides actually a very negative example of childlike behavior. Um, you know, so we can. Uh, just a little background on on Jewish culture at the time. They had their own prosperity gospel. We have ours. They had theirs, and and in Jewish culture, uh, uh, a wealthy man was considered to be blessed by God, right? And so, wealthy men were looked on as being very spiritual, and and we're going to see here. Uh, it's very interesting because even the disciples pick up on this um, a little bit. But, but I think it sets the context for uh, some of the questions that Peter asks. Uh, it, it certainly sets the context for the rich young ruler because if everyone else is thinking he's spiritual, of course he's thinking he's pretty spiritual too. And, and I think he came to Jesus. Uh, my interpretation, my read of this is that he came to Jesus, you know, legitimately wanting an answer to his question. He, he didn't, this isn't, this isn't like the Pharisees approaching with an agenda of antagonism, I think he came with some baggage, some arrogance. But but I, I think he truly was trying to seek out. You know what what do I need to do? Um, so keep that in mind as we go through this, and we'll we'll come back and touch on that in just a minute. Uh, but you know nothing new under the sun, right? Uh, the uh, Israelites had their own prosperity gospel. I thought that was very funny. So uh, Matthew 19, verses 16 through 22. Matthew 19, verses 16 through 22. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And so he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. But if you enter into life, but if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? So he's asked, Jesus tells him, you know, the, the rich young ruler comes up and inquires, hey, uh, what do I need to do to get into the kingdom? Jesus says, you need to keep the commandments. So the rich young ruler says, well, which ones? Right? I mean, I, to me, this is a genuine inquiry. Um, and Jesus says, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, and what do I still lack? All these things I've kept from my youth, but what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, go and sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And when the young man heard that saying, he went, he went away very sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He went away very sorrowful before he had great possessions. The... Uh, so a little a little background on, on on again getting context for these parables, but it was it was customary in in uh, in, in Jewish culture if a young man wanted to study under a rabbi, he would walk around. This sounds very odd, but he would spend uh, maybe a month all the way up to a year following the rabbi around town. So he would basically keep his mouth shut and just follow whatever rabbi that he wanted to study under. He would follow him around town. And so this concept of following is, is a little bit odd to us, but, but Jesus is presenting uh, to, this, to this rich young ruler a, a concept that he would very well understand, you know, this, the, the, this concept of following. And then um, if, if the rabbi accepted you after you followed him around, if the rabbi accepted you, then he would train you. And so there was kind of this process. And, and we, see, we see in Jesus, uh, in, in uh, Matthew and Mark and Luke, there, the, this theme is there. It's a little different. Jesus is uh, a little different. Sometimes the, the difference, you know, the time period between the calling and uh, the accepting him as the Messiah was, was short. Sometimes it was a little bit longer. And then there was a teaching and then there was a sending out on a mission. So we see, what we see is like the way Jesus would approach, he would approach and ask someone to follow him. 
And, and uh, for example, uh, Peter. And if, if Peter accepted that invitation, then Jesus would teach that person. And then after he had taught that person, again, different lengths of time here, but follow this progression. So Jesus comes, he asks them to follow. The person accepts the invitation. Jesus teaches them. And then Jesus says, believe on me. He makes the offer to accept him as the Messiah. And then after that acceptance, uh, Jesus develops them for whatever their mission was. And so, so this offer that we have uh, to this rich young ruler, uh, it, it sounds, you know, on, on the surface, when, when I first read this, you know, it, it comes across kind of like a work salvation thing. Hey, you know, if you want to enter into the heaven, uh, sell all your goods. You know, that's a good deed. And, but, I, but really what Jesus is getting at here is this man's priorities, right? And so this question, this challenge that Jesus put in front of him, it really cuts through everything, right? Because, I mean, here we got a guy, uh, Jesus doesn't, uh, and he knew, he didn't say, hey, no, you haven't followed these commandments, right? So the guy says, hey, I followed all these commandments. He's demonstrating that, I, you know, I want, in, in his effort to follow these commandments, he's, he's, just, he's demonstrated that he has some level of commitment um, and he's inquired of Jesus, well, if I follow these and it's not enough, what, what other commandments do I need to follow? And, and so Jesus, instead of running down this rabbit trail, just cuts right to the heart of the matter. He says, hey, if you want into the kingdom, sell your goods and follow me. And, and the way that, that we should hear that in the context, the way that rich young ruler heard that is, is follow me and obey me. And, and, and that leads to salvation because then you would accept him as the Messiah. And so, you know, we see this challenge uh, to the rich young ruler. Of course, he goes away. So let's, let's uh, run through some of our notes here. All right, verse 16, Matthew 19, verse 16. The rich young man's question showed, that his false, showed his false belief that he could do something good to gain entrance into eternal life. That he could do something good to gain entrance into eternal life. Verse 17, Jesus' answer implied that since, since the rich man thought he could do good to earn God's favor, he did not understand goodness. He did not understand goodness. Uh, verses 18 through 20, uh, the proud rich ruler claimed to have obeyed these commandments in his relationships with men, but he realized he still lacked something he needed to enter the kingdom. That he still lacked something that he, he needed to enter the kingdom. In verse 21, uh, finally, uh, Jesus was not teaching a work salvation. Jesus was not teaching a work salvation. This, this call to follow me would be uh, similar to what, what we would hear when, when Pastor Dean from the pulpit gives the invitation to accept Christ as Savior or, or when you're witnessing to someone. That, that call to follow Jesus, we should think of that as, as a similar invitation Right in that culture, in the way that that discipleship worked uh, during that time, and so what we see is that um, Jesus is not teaching a work salvation, but he's showing that man's faith was in his wealth. So he cuts again; he cuts right to the core of the issue, because the rich man, young man, I, this is very interesting. He understands uh, at some level, perhaps not completely, but at some level, he understands. Because he doesn't walk away mad or indignant, or he walks away sad, right? And so I, I think Jesus really cut his heart here, right? Because he, he, he showed him his pride. You know, we don't know what became of the rich, and maybe he later on accepted Christ as his Savior. Right? We're, we're not told. But, but I, I just thought it was interesting that the, the reaction was sad. Because clearly, if, if he was sad, because he knew, he understood what his priorities were. Um, and so... Anyway, back to, uh, back to the script here, showing that uh, this man's faith was in his wealth, his money, and possessions, and it kept him from having a simple, childlike faith in the Lord. He needed to change his mind, repent about wealth as his idol, and believe the salvation message about Jesus as Messiah. And then uh, finally here in verse 22, uh, the man's grief at the Lord's word showed that he depended on his wealth 
more than on Jesus' grace offer. Um, you know, another thing that really hit me about this, this particular parable and, you know, talking about these threads of truth that, that come to us, you know, um, you know, looking, reading this parable, it's very easy for me to kind of go, man, you know, this rich young ruler, he really messed this deal up bad, right? I mean, here's the Lord, right, in front of him, his Messiah, making this offer. If he, if he understood, you know, if he'd only understood that, that these things that he's so invested himself in are just going to go away, and, and our Lord basically has just offered him an eternal inheritance, right, that's going to last forever, Um and but but the truth is, uh, you know, we can put ourselves into uh, the place of the rich, run, rich, rich young ruler, and we don't have to be wealthy. It could be any idol, anything that we consider more important than than our Lord, right? I think that, uh, and every day I think it's a struggle for all of us, right, to keep our priorities uh, straight. And so there's, I think, an application for us here as well. Uh, certainly for me, um, in, in going through this, this parable and, and understanding, you know, because I understand clearly the, uh, you know, the ch- when I make the choice, it's not in ignorance. When, when I make a choice that, that doesn't honor the priorities that, that we learn here from God's word, it's certainly not in ignorance. I mean, we've been taught very well. And, and so very, very similar to the uh, rich young ruler. So... All right. And then finally, uh, just a commentary on Mark 10, chapter 24. Um, Synoptic, a a similar, a second telling of the story is that only Mark's gospel recorded that Jesus said wealth was the object uh, of of the rich man's faith. It was his idol. And so um, the, the disciples see this uh, confrontation unfold. And so let's jump over to uh, Matthew 19, Matthew 19, verse 23. Verse 23. So just, uh, again, we're right on the tail of uh, the disciples uh, have watched Jesus interact with this rich man. And, and keep in mind, in their minds, Right, they they have, and we'll see this developed here. I think Jesus gives them some pushback on this in, in this particular. But I think they have some of this prosperity gospel right going on in their heads uh, because you know they they too uh, the, based off of their questions the, and the way that they ask them, they're very surprised that Jesus has rejected the rich young ruler, right? So. So at some level, they, in my mind, they've bought into this prosperity gospel that was present back then. They, they, they have this concept that, goodness, you know, Jesus, you've just rejected this. He's so rich. He must be so spiritual. Why would you reject him? And so um, Jesus goes into uh, just a, a quick teaching moment here. He says, and, and then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And it is, when his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished. They were greatly astonished. I, I wonder why. why. Why? Why would that shock them so much? That uh, so, I, I, in my mind, um, they had bought in at some level to this prosperity gospel teaching, and, and Jesus is is pushing them back and, and saying. And, and they heard and said to him, well, who then can be saved, right? And so you can see the context of this uh, question from their perspective, not ours, but from their perspective. Here is this rich young man, obviously been blessed by the Lord uh, in their thinking, okay? Obviously very spiritual. And, and he can't come into the kingdom, and he's kept, he's kept the laws too, Lord. I mean, goodness. Um, and so, you know, who then can be saved? And, and I think uh, Jesus... Uh, answer here is is very telling and jesus looked at him and said with men this is impossible so this question of salvation that uh that the disciples put in front of him jesus immediately responds is with men this is impossible but with god all things are possible 
but with God all things are possible. And so I, I think what we see here is, is that, uh, that Jesus is really cut to the heart of the matter um, of this prosperity gospel, and, and he's put, he shifted uh, salvation uh, from the penalty of sin, salvation from the penalty of sin, onto the burden is on God. There's nothing that we can do f uh, for that penalty, right? We accept, accept the free offer. And uh, so, and, and that's emphasized with men, this is impossible. And then with God, all things are possible. And so God has the solution, which we know, they don't know, but we know is that our Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross and paid for our sins. And, and they would have understood this, this offer as accepting Christ as their Messiah. Uh, that would have been the salvation offer, the free gift offer, the grace salvation offer that they would have understood. So um, Jesus responds, and then in verse 27, um, Peter was always pretty quick to react to these things. And so he answered, then Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? So, so uh, Peter was quick. He, was, he wanted to point out, Hey, Lord, we, we have, uh, we've left everything here. And, um, and so Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. So let's. Uh, there's a lot to kind of unpack here. Um, I think it's. Uh, I think Peter. I, I I get a kick out of Peter because I can see myself reacting the same way in the situation. You know, it get a little bit impetuous, uh, but d definitely paying attention, but wanting some answers right away. And you know, Peter was quick to point out uh, that, hey, look, Lord, we. We've given everything away, just like you've told this rich young ruler to do. And what are we going to get? You know, where's my share, right? And and um, and so our Lord, you know, I think our Lord, the way that He answered Peter, um, it, I think ties. Uh, there's a thread we're going to pull up here between inheritance um, and and kind of really develop that a little bit. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, let's talk about verses 28. Through thirty, you know, Jesus shifts from a salvation from the penalty of sin, um, which is faith alone in Christ alone, or faith in the Messiah, and he, he weaves uh, he weaves this together with with salvation from the power of sin. So you know we have uh, Jesus kind of shifts from, uh, hey, there is no work salvation. Salvation is at this time believing in the Messiah for us. It's faith alone in Christ alone, and then once you've done that. If you want an inheritance, and the, and the concept of, of leaving your father and mother, that, that is a, in my mind, that's an issue of priorities. I mean, what Jesus is, he's not telling them literally, in order to have an inheritance, you have to leave your mother or your brother or your son or your daughter. What he's saying is that I have to be the most important thing in your life. Because if I'm not the most important thing in your life, you're not going to follow me. And if you're not going to follow me, you're not going to obey me. And if you don't obey me, then you're not going to inherit the kingdom, right? And um, so let's, uh, let's jump over here and take a look at, uh, at verses 28 through 30 now. And we see this shift We see this shift to inheritance. Our Lord starts to talk about inheritance, and so I thought um, I thought what we could do is uh, jump over to Titus. Let's jump over to Titus three verses one through eight. Titus three verses one through eight. And I'm going to read through this real quick, and remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities to obey to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were once also foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. 
But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs. And this is where we're going to make the connection here with this uh, this passage in Matthew, right? This air, this concept of heirship, right? Um, we become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And we're going to develop this uh, eternal life just a little bit. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. Those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. These things are good and profitable to men. And so... What we have here is Paul's writing uh, in this letter to Titus at, in, in Crete. Um, uh, he he kind of breaks this into, into two categories, right? We have, uh, what, let's do a little bit of context. In, in the lead up to this part of, of Titus, Paul's really been focused on the internal machinations of the church and, and how the church needs to get along, how it needs to function internally as a body. Um, and, you know, this is application to the body of Christ, and it has application to the local church. But now Paul shifted, and, and he starts talking about how the church should be seen from the outside. How does, how does the church, how do members of the church, how do we interact um, with, uh, with the world around us? And, and so I find it very interesting, um, particularly for me in this time, uh, the, uh, one of the uh, first things that Paul says the very first thing is remember to be subject to your rulers and authorities and to obey and to be ready for every good work and there's no caveats here uh, it doesn't say well if you uh, like the political party of your ruler uh, or your authority then you need to be subject to them there's no caveats it's just be subject to your rulers um, but I think um, as, as tough as that is for us to stomach sometimes um, I think that, that uh, and we'll develop this a little bit more, but if, if we develop these characteristics, if these are the things that characterize our life, obedience, ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, to be gentle, to show all humility to men, right? If, if those are the characteristics that someone says, that, well, hey, you know that guy, uh, Jeff Phipps? Oh, yeah, I know Jeff. You know, he's... Uh, peaceable he's gentle he shows humility uh, he's subject to the rulers and authorities that's that's the kind of person okay that's the kind of person that can have an influence right when we talk about the salt of the earth when we when we see all these horrible things that are happening in our country and and all these uh, terrible decisions you know um, and these just uh, the grotesque things that they do with uh, the unborn babies now we, we've seen all and you know it's, it makes you sick to your stomach um, but but Paul Paul is really clear here that that for us to have an effectual change, to us to have an effectual impact, right? We can't we can't react to that in bitterness and disgust. We we need to we need to be peaceable. We need to respect the authorities until you know. As in Daniel, we have this great example in Daniel. I'm going back through uh, Pastor Dean's Daniel series. Um, I listened to it seven or eight years ago it's really a, a great series on how to interact with an ugly world right um and 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 what i what i've taken away from daniel is that that my responsibility it, it with respect to the rulers and authorities is to follow them until they t tell me to do something that directly contradicts god's word and and, and pastor dean has taught us that as well but uh, until that happens there's an expectation that if I'm walking, uh, walking by the Spirit, th this is what should characterize my life. Even today, with all the nastiness that's going on, these are the things that should characterize my life. The, um, so Paul builds this picture of, of what somebody that's walking by the Spirit, what that looks like. And then, and then in the middle, uh, he, he draws a contrast with, the, hey, these are the things that it doesn't look like. So let's go through those real quick. Um, and, and, and let me know, it, as we go through these, 
if somebody that demonstrated these types of characteristics, the types of characteristics that, that we all have in our nature, if we're not walking by the Spirit, right, because we all have a sinful nature, if somebody came to you demonstrating these characteristics, would you be influenced by them? Would, would, you, would you feel like they were somebody you could look up to or follow or could trust, right? So um, foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. Um, I, think, I think if somebody, uh, if that's what marks someone's life, they're certainly not going to have much of an influence on me at all. May, it may be the type of influence that, you know, man, but therefore the grace of God go I, and I'll steer clear of that guy so I don't get none of the discipline coming. But that's not the kind of person that has an influence on society. Right, the, 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 and so when we see all these things unfold, um, and again we're talking about how the church, Titus here is talking about how the church interfaces with the world, right? Um, these characteristics that that should mark us as individual believers, it should mark our church, uh, West Houston Bible Church, it should mark the body of Christ. The um, but let's develop a little bit about. Um, the foundation that we have, the support that we have to develop this character that we're called to, because certainly this is a high calling, right? Particularly for uh, fallen men and women, right? So not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through our through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs to the people of eternal, for the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying that these things I want you to affirm constantly. This is a faithful saying that these things I want you, and these things I want you to affirm constantly. That those who have believed in God, and, and so when we go to this this, those who have believed in God, we've had this description, and I think this covers everybody that I see. I know everyone in this room, this fits us. Everyone in this room I know has accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. And so Paul says those who have believed in God, and, and he's talking about this salvation message, this regeneration. Now we're new creatures in Christ, right? Um, and, and he's talking about... He builds this foundation of the Holy Spirit here through regeneration that we have uh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Um, but then he shifts. He shifts, and, and, and I think this to me is, is a very important shift um, because these characteristics um, aren't going to be automatic. You know, the Holy Spirit isn't going to take over our lives and, and turn us into, uh, you know, Sub, the Holy Spirit isn't going to make us subject to the rulers and authorities. Um, uh, he, the Holy Spirit's not going to make us obey. The Holy Spirit's not going to make us do every good work, right? So there's, there's this interface between us and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We can't do it without the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. Um, it's impossible to do anything that pleases God apart from the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But I, I think it's interesting where Paul brings this after he's built these, these contrasting pictures of character, he builds, uh, he shares with us this, this concept of salvation and regeneration, a new creature in Christ. And then immediately he says, this is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. And, and the good works we can, uh, certainly the, this is not an exhaustive list here in verses one through three. Uh, but I think, uh, I think this is, to me at least, this was an emphasis that this is a partnership. And, and there's a reason why we come and learn God's word. Um, and it's not just to fill up our notebooks. Um, I, I know that uh, I came from a, a background where, uh, many years ago, where I, I had a huge notebook. I have, a, in fact, I have four boxes full of huge notebooks. <laughs> Um, and some of you, I, I know, I uh, can uh, share that uh, with me. And, and nothing wrong with that. I'm not knocking that at all. But, but the point is, the point was not to fill up the notebook, right? The point is to learn so that uh, we can obey. As Paul says here, right, uh, the point is to maintain good works, right, through the filling of the Holy Spirit. So um, let's, let's 
let's tie this together a little bit with, um, you know, Paul mentions this inheritance. Jesus had mentioned this inheritance. And, and so we have this thread between us uh, and the Lord uh, and our Lord's message to, uh, to the disciples. Because Jesus basically was saying, hey, uh, to his disciples, in, in a sense, he was saying the same thing that, that Paul was saying to uh, the believers in Crete, that you need to get your priorities straight, right? And, and the way Jesus explained it to the, the apostles was, you know, you know, leave your father, leave your mother. Uh, these would have all been, uh, you know, uh, for, for his audience to hear this, uh, it, for us to hear this. You know, if somebody says, hey, leave your father and, and follow me or, or leave your son and follow me, you know, that has a big impact. It really challenges what your priorities are in life. Um, and, and Paul does the same thing here. Um, I, I want to touch a little bit on, on this concept of inheritance. we got about five minutes, and, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. But I wanted to touch a little bit on this concept of inheritance. And, and Paul talks about this uh, hope that we have in this eternal life. And, and over in John 10, I think it's in verse 11, that, that Jesus says, I came to give life, and I came to give it abundantly. I came to give it abundantly. So I want to connect, even though there is an eternal inheritance, and, and, and clearly that's where our hope should be, right? Paul tells us right there that our, our hope should be in that eternal inheritance. But if we're living our lives in a way that, that is going to gain us that inheritance, we will have a very abundant life. And I, I think that this is a very uh, sincere offer of our Lord uh, over, you know, you, you take John 11, I came to give life and give it abundantly, and you jump over to John 15, and you tie that in with the vine and that whole concept of abiding, right? That whole concept of abiding. And I think that really brings together the, this concept of having an abundant life here on earth right now with our walk with the Lord. So um, with that, we're going to... Uh, close down let me uh, I have a little conclusion here the uh, I think Titus I think Titus sums it up best uh, says that this is a faithful saying that the things and these things I want to I want you to affirm constantly these things I want you to remember constantly that those who have believed in God those who have that gift of regeneration that, that were new creatures in Christ those who are new creatures in Christ should be careful to maintain good works. And, and that, that call there, be careful, I, I find that very, uh, I mean, that cuts to my heart. Right? Uh, be careful. Um, watch out, Jeff, what you're doing. Make sure your priorities every morning are squared away. And then, and then in the end, Paul concludes here with, these things are good and profitable to men. These things are good and profitable to men. So uh, let me close down in a word of prayer. Father, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to share your word. Um, we, pray, uh, we pray that it will have its effect. We pray, Father, we ask that uh, we would use this uh, teaching your word, not the teaching, but your word. Father, we pray that we would use it to walk in a manner that's worthy of our Lord. Uh, Father, help us uh, corporately, help us individually to be fruitful in every good work. Father, help us uh, corporately and individually uh, to learn and increase in knowledge about you. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.